no, we don't want to get rid of them because of whatever. It was a long conversation yeah, yeah. to help them and whiteboard not just the cost of the inventory. Let's say it was $100,000 of cash sitting on a shelf. That was yep. the market value, not yeah. the retail value. Right, right, they right. could liquidate them. So it's 100000 but what else was cost? This whole concept of opportunity cost exactly. and friction cost. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, Elevate IQ. While companies understand the importance of cash, they struggle to create processes and KPIs that help them drive cash for the company. Cash is the ultimate lifeblood of the companies and they could have cash issues because of so many reasons. The cash issues could be because how you are allocating your inventory to each channels. They could also be due to inability to map the cash cycle of the business. Finally, they could be because you might be hyper-focused on revenue. In today's episode, our guest David Safir shares why companies need to shift their mindset to cash-focused strategies. He also talks about cash-related topics such as variables that drive cash issues with businesses the KPIs that mislead businesses and cause performance issues and how sales strategies might result into cash improvement. Finally, he shared several stories where he was able to save cash for several companies through his mindset. Let me introduce David to you. David Safir is a globally recognized expert in cash flow optimization. His work has impacted hundreds of businesses with revenue from $1 million to $20 million in 40 countries. As president of Lomega Latin America Incorporation, David grew revenue by 404% in five years and profits by 181%. At Kodak, he transformed his division from years of loss to profitability in 18 months. David has a master's degree in international management and 20 years of working with Fortune 100 companies such as Morgan Stanley and Dell. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, David. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Sam. It is great to be here. Yeah, and I am super excited as well uh, because the kind of insights and the stories that you are going to have for our financial executives, it's going to be so fascinating. Just to kick things off, David, do you want to start with your uh, personal story and your current focus? Well, yeah, I'd love to. But before that, let me tell you how much I enjoy your podcast. It always brings, there's incredible depth that I just don't get out of other podcasts. So I really appreciate that. I Thank wanted you. to let you know personally. Thank so you. my Thank story you. is that I started in corporate America. I worked for companies like Morgan Stanley, Kodak, and um, uh, Seagate, and other really big companies. But uh, as I went through there, I, I had increasing levels of responsibility, ended up as a general manager, the president of a subsidiary of a publicly owned company. It was great. But you know what the one thing I never worried about was? Cash. Yep. And then I started doing consulting work and I did all sorts of different things. And I realized everything people were asking me to do revolved around cash, increasing sales, um, marketing. It all ended up back to cash. So I decided to specialize about four years ago. That's yep. all I talk about right now is cash flow. And the majority of it is for companies that are growing quickly. Yeah. 
could not agree more. And that's a great point. In fact, we have had a lot of different uh, episodes discussing about cash and everybody agrees on the importance of cash. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing those stories. Before we do that, we have one more standard question, David, that we ask every single year. And that is going to be your perspective on business growth. And I know that that's probably going to be around cash, uh, but I'm still (laughs) curious to hear that. (laughs) <laughs> well, it is. But let me tell you, the, the thing that drives me crazy is the hyper focus on yep. revenue yep. without yep. thinking about the impact on profitability. Yep. It is crazy yep. in my mind, these huge companies that lose billions of dollars because they're just trying to get revenue. So that's one thing. Uh, my yep. focus yep. thing about growth, to me, it's not everything. Yep. Um, but um, number two is, we see, I see more companies getting into trouble yep. on the cash side because of growth than because of stagnant or even decreasing markets. And it's because they don't understand their yep. cash cycle and where it is. And so that's my one thing is I'm always hammering on that. You've got to understand what your cash needs are going to be as you're growing. Yeah, so some great insights there. So obviously, you know, I am always looking for the depth that you had mentioned, and we have recorded some episode on cash, uh, and everybody sort of talks about, you know, how uh, companies should be doing KPIs around cash. Typically, if KPIs are going to be really around their revenue, then people are probably going to be motivated to get more revenue. But if you cannot collect the cash, then, you know, it's going to be a problem. So obviously, they recommend some of the solutions around that. So I don't know if you're going to have any specific stories where you have gone through the cycle of cash planning where the cash position was slightly more stabilized than it would be for companies that are not as good at managing their cash, I guess. I, I am. I've, I actually sort of want to do a case study. I can't mention it, but it's a client I worked with about yeah. five years ago. I can't mention their name, yeah, that's but okay. certainly there's all sorts of details yeah. And it's beyond just the accounts receivable. Yep. And it's beyond yep. just the accounts payable. There's so much more depth. Yep. And it, I always tie everything back to cash. Um, but we're going to hear about inventory. Uh, we're going to hear about inventory and production and um, product margin yep. and all sorts of things and costs and paying more instead of less for things because of. We're going to, as much as you want to talk and we can cram in, yeah. we're going to give you lots yeah. of detail today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, do you have any stories that you might be able to share? So maybe uh, try to talk about their business model, you know, what they were doing this particular client, what was their background, where they were struggling, and what was a sort of, what were the measures that were taken to make sure their cash was intact? Well, let, let's set up the scenario first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah. here's the scenario. This is a specialty um, manufacturer of plastics. Okay. And they manufacture gas cans Yeah. just to transport gasoline, but they were specialty for off-road. And their manufacturing was fairly complicated, and it required large pieces of equipment, yeah. $100,000 or more. Yeah. And specialized trained operators. Okay. And okay, so that's the basics. They were running 24 7. Okay. 360 days a year. They probably took off Christmas, you know, but they were full out. Yeah. They were selling everything they could manufacture as quickly as they could manufacture it, but they had an issue, two issues that were related. Yeah. Number one, yeah. revenue was going down. Okay. And number two, margins were decreasing. Well, they didn't know margins were decreasing. Yeah. They just saw the profits were going down. Okay. So they, that was all I was told as I talked to the business owner. Yeah. That's the only information he gave me. Where do you go from there, right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's where, you know, I am always curious. And okay, tell me the variables that are driving these things, right? Results are great. Right. Um, you know, I don't care whether you lose money or make money. What I really care for, what are my variables? <laughs> what are your variables? And so I looked at it strictly. Um, I do have a background in yeah. finance and accounting, but I'm not an accountant. Okay. But I run okay. reports and I just start looking at reports going, Well, you're selling everything, and sure enough, revenue is starting to go down. And so here's my bottom line. Yeah. A lot of times, people are in cash flow problems. You can't find it in the report. 
It's not in the computer system. That just provides you information. It tells you what is happening, but not why. And so I start interviewing. Yep. All right. And so first we're going to talk about the revenue. Why is revenue going down? Yeah. And so the first thing uh, we talk about is they've got a distribution channel. Okay. They have three ways to distribute. Number one. They sell to wholesalers. Right. N- number two, the, the wholesalers who sell to retailers yeah. who sell to the end users. Yeah. Number two, they sell to retailers okay. that sell to the public. Number three, they sell directly to the public on the internet. Yeah. And yeah. makes sense. Two, three different. That's great. Okay. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're having a real issue. Our retailers keep canceling their orders. And we can't produce enough, but we need to sell to our wholesalers because they're our biggest clients. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's what I said. Okay. And then I said, but what about um, internet sales? Yeah. That's only if we have stuff left over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. (laughs) So I said, so let me understand this. You're already smiling because you're already figuring this out on your own. Yeah. So let me understand this. Your biggest client is also the one that gives you the smallest revenue and the smallest margin. Yep. And they said, well, okay, they didn't think along those lines. This is the hyper-focus on what? Revenue, Revenue, right? Not total revenue, but the individual company, that's our best client. So who's their worst client is the person paying on the internet because they're only buying one. So they have very, okay. So that was a huge shift that had to happen to go rank your rank your clients best to worst. Yeah. So you can probably guess what the results were. The the best clients were the individual clients on the Internet. Yep. Then the retail. Yeah. And then the distributors. And so what was happening, the distributor, the retailers were canceling their orders. Yeah. And going and who had the product was the distributors. Yeah. Buy from them. And it was a reinforcing cycle that that's why there was more and more demand from the distributors because they were starving the retail. Yeah, yeah. So the solution was to flip it on its head. And they said, well, and so so much of this, when we're talking about systems, and I love the fact you're hyper-focused on systems and and computers, but there's a saying that something along the lines, if you think the computer can actually solve the problem, yeah. you don't really understand yeah. computers. They they can't really solve the problem. You have to solve them, and then they can help you keep them solved. Right, right. Yep, agreed. So, yeah, at least, okay, we're, we're yeah. in agreement on that? Yep, 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 100%. So one of the solutions was they said, our distributors aren't going to like it. And I said, well, how do you know if you talk to them? Yeah. Well, no, call them up. And ask if they are willing to accept partial shipments. Yeah. So then they get whatever's left over. Yeah. After you ship to your wholesaler, uh, retailers, uh, and, and internet clients. And lo and behold, they were shocked. Distributors are used to this. They're not the distributors all over the world will take yeah. short shipments. And so that's what happened. And within it, this took over a period of only about six weeks to do the investigation and figure this all out. Yeah. But sure enough, almost immediately, revenue started increasing significantly. Okay. And all of that revenue, that incremental revenue, was yeah. almost pure profit. W- why wasn't it all pure profit? Because shipping costs were higher for individual orders into retailers, but were far less than the incremental revenue that was gained. And oftentimes, uh, the shipping was paid for versus the distributors you the company had to pay for the ship. Okay, so very interesting. So let me try to sort of uh, you know understand the story. I'm going to unpack a little bit and let's see Good. how much I could really understand. So I get the problem that you have the biggest customer. Obviously, they are probably going to have the most political as well, and the most sensitive conversations are probably going to happen there because you cannot afford to piss them off. It's, it's as simple as that, right? So Absolutely. you, right? So you figured out that, you know what, uh, and this is very common. It happens in our customer base as well. These are very, very, very standard channel. DTC is always going to be sort of the stepchild, always, always, with most uh, distributors. Uh, and it's not that they sort of don't understand that DTC is going to be more profitable. Uh, it's very hard for them to be able to think 
okay, how they can scale that DTC model and how they can get the same revenue without really offending their their distributors that, okay, now I am actually going to be stealing your market share. So which is a very sensitive right. argument in, in, in general. So in this particular case, I mean, I am still not able to understand how the partial shipment solved your problem. So here you are saying you were actually sending the left over to DTC channel, which I understand that you were doing that. But how did partial sh- shipment solve the problem? So did they make DTC as their primary channel and whatever was left over that was sent to distributors? I'm not sure if I follow the story there. Yes, that is correct. So they sent uh, DTC direct to customer. I'm yeah. assuming that's what that. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. great yeah. with acronyms. Yeah, uh, acronyms. Sorry, so direct Sorry to customer. That. Yeah, because it was also very low volume. Yeah, right. This, it was very low volume. Yeah, and then they would ship. To, that has the highest, and it was full price. Yeah, they were not discounting on light, online, and so that is part of the way you protect your retailers. You protect yeah. your distributors. That it's full price, yeah. you, they have to pay for shipping, yeah. so it's more expensive actually for a consumer yeah. to buy direct sometimes yeah. from the manufacturer. So that's number one. So they would sell there, they got the higher prices, they got from the higher margins, and then they would ship to retailers. Now that's really that took up the volume. Yeah. And so when you fulfill to the retailers first, they're canceling their orders now at the distributor. So it actually reduces the distributor volume. And it wasn't, I should have made this clear, they had a limited number of larger retailers that had chains. Okay. So in a, in a certain respect, these retailers act like a distributor, centralized warehouse that they would then send out to their local stores. And so, but they got, they, but they had higher prices than the true distributor so you had an incremental margin from selling there. Yeah. And yeah. then what was left over went to distributors. Now, distributors still received the bulk of their orders on a timely basis, but they just weren't getting everything that they wanted right away. Does that help clarify? Yeah, it does. It does. So I am going to you know repeat some more and see... Uh, okay. You know, if you can provide some more clarifications there so that our listeners are able to follow along as well. So I get the point that you sort of reshuffled uh, this whole shipping arrangement. And because of that, sort of the, the revenue increase. But in my mind, there are two things. When I think of the DTG channel, especially for my customers, when we deal with our customers, a lot of companies think that DTG is probably going to be your free revenue. Um, and they sort of don't include the marketing cost in that. Typically, the marketing cost for the DTC channel is going to be far higher. Building the dominance on SEO, driving traffic through your DTC channel, selling to Amazon or any other channel, they are probably going to have 20, 30% cut, you know, the way your distributors yeah, are taking. Cost. So it's, 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 cost. it's very similar. And by the way, you know, when I think of the market opportunity, you know, I am still of the belief that you know, market is sort of constant, okay? It's very hard to increase the revenue unless there is some, some something happening here overall from the business model perspective. Either you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, tapping into any new product categories or uh, increasing significant value of the product that consumers are uh, willing to pay more. So do you have any more colors there in terms of the, the revenue increase other than what you already provided? Well, the other thing I'd keep in mind is that this is a specific situation where there is a production constraint. Okay. All right. So we had to maximize the value of this finite level of inventory. So that was number one. Number two, the only DTC they did was on their website, and they did not spend money on SEO or anything else. Okay. And that was because... They were trying to provide the service without truly competing. They weren't trying to drive sales. They were immature in that area. So we did not need to take into account the additional costs, which you mentioned, which are absolutely spot on for um, spot on for the direct to consumer marketplace. Um, that being said, they had 50% additional margin to play with. There was a lot of extra money there if they did decide they wanted to spend some money to actually drive demand 
it would have been there. Okay, very cool. So let's go back to the the profit now. So now the revenue is probably increased based on reshuffling of the channels. You know, the way we were doing business. Um, so what were some of the considerations that you had to take? Uh, you know, with respect to increasing the profit as well as cash is what uh, you know we both are interested in talking again. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk about another production constraint. Okay, please. If I, if I could. Please, because please. This, 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 they, they all of a sudden they would run out of product, and, okay. and it was interesting. So the really uh, the the true the truly constrained product was the main container, okay. but they had caps and rings and spouts that were manufactured overseas. Okay, and they did not have an in, uh, inventory system that uh, that they figured out how to pre-order. Okay, I mean, this is. 101, inventory run 01. Yeah. If you estimate when you're going to run out and you purchase um, before you run out. So that was another issue. Now, it was very interesting because they wanted to bring it over on boat. Now, this is pre COVID, okay. so you knew the time frames. Yeah. yeah. But, so they said, fine, we'll bring it over on boat. But I said, but you're going to be out of inventory. You won't be able to ship anything for two weeks, three yeah. weeks. You should fly it over here. And they said, oh, no, it's too expensive. Uh, you know, it drives the cost up. And I was like, no, but you don't understand. You can't interrupt your supply chain. Right. Bottom line is we did an analysis and said, fine, put an order in for 20000 or whatever the number was yeah. and just ship 2000 by plane. Okay. And then you get into an inventory ordering system yeah. that will, would allow you to just have continual flow. Now, again, this is inventory 101 for most of your listeners, but some of your listeners are probably growing quickly and really have not implemented an inventory control system. So that's why I'm bringing that up. Yeah, so very interesting point there. So did they have any sort of system? How were they doing this analysis? Because that could be slightly more involved in knowing, you know, how many do you need to split? How many do you need to order? What is going to be the yeah. impact on production? Based on that, no. and what is going to be your profit margin? No, the answer is they did not. And so I helped them put up, put together a system in preparing for the show today. Yeah. I went back and yeah. found the spreadsheet that literally says, how many are you shipping? How many cans are you shipping a, a week or a month? Yeah. And so we ended up being able to calculate a run rate, which yeah. is totally, um, was a foreign concept of how many you're shipping. Why? Where was the hyper focus? Revenue. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You need to you need to know how many. Why would you need to all we care about is how much revenue we ship today. Right. So so there is a fundamental problem and it came from the top down, which is why the business owner hired me to help implement some of these systems. So it was a simple spreadsheet. You plug in how many you're shipping, how many you are um uh how many yeah, what what's your safety stock? And then the the shipping times. And once we got through this first one, yeah. if you just order it on time, you, you ship it by boat. You know it takes two months, and you're basically putting in your orders before that. You you have you have multiple orders on hand because it's a, it's on a boat. You don't wait. Uh, it's a, it's a hard concept for some people. Yeah, yeah. And you're la you're laughing. Have you heard about this? You you've seen this before. Oh, we have seen all kinds of scenarios. And typically in our case, to be honest, I'll give you one story and maybe you are going to have some follow-up commentary there as well. So in this particular case, and I don't know how complex their bombs were, the more complex your bombs are going to be, the more problems you are going to have. Because typically when you are looking at more of the either distribution scenario or the light manufacturing, in the case of distribution scenario, you really have sort of one-to-one -one correlation. You are buying one product, you are probably shipping one product. It's much easier overall to follow along when you are mapping from your demand to your supply. Light manufacturing, let's say you are assembling two or three or maybe manufacturing four or five. But, you know, when you get into the real deep complex manufacturing, okay, what happens is you are going to have overarching demand that is easy to compute. How many are you shipping today? Okay, go to your dock, ask your warehouse guy. He would know in his hand how many he ship because he's doing it. Right. It's very easy to compute that. Right. right. Now let's, let's take the, the whole workflow here. So now you are looking at, okay, how many of our products that you shipped 
okay what are their bill of okay and each of the bill of materials are going to have their own sub assemblies and the materials as well and each of those sub assemblies they can be produced internally they can be part so you are opening the whole can of worm and sometimes it becomes very 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 hard to find out when you are looking at this whole consolidated demand and consolidated supply where the problem is and even though we do this on a daily side that's hard for us as well unless you have some sort of system that can give you the end to temerity it becomes very hard so i don't know if this was more of the simpler product more complex product plastic is a relatively simpler in my mind but mm-hmm. they they could get very complex as well yeah and it it is simpler i've worked in job shops yeah which is what you described but you know it's not flow manufacturing and that's that's really complicated but here's the here is the fortunate thing yeah they probably had i i'd say three or four dozen models of gas cans of colors and sizes they had three sizes and multiple yeah. colors but the good news on this particular part it was the same one for every single gas can so it was a lot easier to deal yeah. with than if there was a separate uh, part on each one um but you know one of the things you talked about was um plastics easier yeah but we had to uh they didn't have a system for ordering plastic yeah the raw pellets that they then use in the manufacturing so that was another one we had to set up i didn't really track the um the benefit of that they never they just came too close often times where they'd be forced into manufacturing for inventory something they didn't want to fa- manufacture that. um but i've i've got another fun story for you yeah please if, yeah if, if you're interested yeah yeah um, yeah so um so we took a look at inventory yeah and um you know companies do this they, they they're really good at something and yep. then somebody says oh but look here's an here's a ancillary product right and so if they're if you're developing gas cans for off road yeah. what else what else do people buy that's an off road product yep that that we could sell yep. and so we were literally walking the warehouse one day and um i said what are those and they said well those are winches okay you you sell winches you hadn't told me about that and this is probably you know weeks after we had started they right. said um tell me about why they're there and you know and they said well we we tried to sell them they don't sell very well yeah and i said so why don't we get rid of them and they're like oh no we don't want to get rid of them because of whatever and it was a long conversation yeah, yeah. to help them and whiteboard not just the cost of the inventory let's say it was $100,000 of cash sitting on a shelf that was yeah. the market value not yeah. the retail value right, right, they right. could liquidate them so it's 100,000 but what else was cost this whole concept of opportunity cost exactly. and friction cost yeah was completely and people have to keep in mind yeah. so they had a warehouse their warehouse constrained these winches which was $100,000 was taking up let's call it three or four bays that could have been storing three times the amount of inventory and the stuff right. that was rotating yeah. in addition they were constantly taking time to move them around from one bay to the next because they needed the space yeah. long story short finally convinced them to liquidate them okay now liquidate meaning they put them on ebay yeah yeah and we we put a system in declining um pricing if they didn't sell the first week reduce it reduce it reduce it yeah and i'd imagine that is a huge problem for many people who are listening to this is they've got pockets of cash sitting around their warehouse yeah that if you were to just hire somebody part time to go liquidate this stuff yeah. you would probably generate a tremendous amount of cash yeah so that's a great way of looking at things so i don't know i mean see let's say if i am doing this for my warehouse and obviously let's say if i have a very small warehouse where i have i don't know 100 products sitting then then it's probably going to be easier but let's say if i have 50000 100000 for uh square foot warehouse then in that it's probably going to be really difficult to find out what is selling what is not selling especially if you are not going to have a system if you have your system mapped to it then you can do multivariate analysis you can find out okay where the cash is and you can do really fun stuff but if you yes. don't have all of that connectivity from your uh, you know sales to your finance and a lot of people i mean you know sometimes it just blows my mind when i have to convince them the advantage of connecting all of the systems and the processes and they just don't get it right 
So maybe right. <laughs> you can tell me, you know, so let's say if I have really not read out, uh, what is going to be the process? Am I simply walking around, finding the products, or how am I uh, finding uh, <laughs> this magical I mean, cash? <laughs> you and I both know that that is not the best way. It's not the most efficient. And I went and looked at the inventory list before the right. show yeah. to find out um, how many units were there uh, of this particular product. And it was long enough ago that I forgot it wasn't on the inventory list. So there was no visibility on this wow. big chunk. And so so what I do, and I try to convince people, I say, it's not about, it's not a, guys, this is a bottom line issue. Yeah. It, you want more growth. You want more margin. You will do a good inventory because not just what is selling, which we've already talked about with the cap cans, yeah. but what is not selling. Yeah. Because your profitability could be coming from scrap. It could be coming from liquidation. And that can add directly to the bottom line. This was only a 2.1 million. Let's just round it down to $2 million company. Yeah. So $100,000 is 5% of their annual revenue. And so liquidating it for 100000 that's 5% to the bottom line. Uh, I mean, yeah. what CFO, what CEO doesn't want that? Exactly. And I can almost guarantee you there was other stuff there that I, I just wasn't as large. And so if somebody doesn't have a system in place, right. then it probably includes hard inventory counting once in a while. Because that's how you, I, I'll tell you another side story. I yeah, know please. somebody who sold, I know somebody who sold a company and let's say it was sold for $3 million to $5 million. Yeah. yeah. They found out after the fact they missed $100,000 in aluminum. A hundred thousand dollars wasn't counted in the inventory, and aluminum is a direct asset value, right? That oh. doesn't it doesn't degrade, yeah. and so the four owners each missed twenty five thousand dollars in the sale. So okay, so 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 let's take a pause here. I, mean, I need to understand this. Okay, so you are saying this? I have these assets, and they are somehow not recognized in the books. So if that is the case, how are books really reconciling? Is that money sitting somewhere else? So how is inventory not recognized in the book? You need to tell me more well, there in these two stories. Sure. Well, what do we reconcile against? When we reconcile books, right. for, it's generally for um, bank account purposes right. and for the P&L purposes. Right. Right. And so when you buy some inventory, you have a choice. Do you put it into inventory right. or, do you, right. or do you expense it? Huh. Now, all right. So that's, that's a choice. Um, some companies don't have a choice because of um, gap and, and local tax laws, et cetera. Right. But, but, but in a system, you, you can do one or the other. Right. That's number one. Number two, when you put it into inventory, you can either put it into itemized inventory right. or you can put it into this big bucket called inventory <laughs> where it's not broken down or a combination of the two. And yeah. so this company would, had, an over, had a combination of the two. They had, they had a, a lot of detailed inventory, so they knew exactly how much they had on their main product lines. But yeah. they had this other bucket that I don't even know. We didn't get down into those details, yeah. but they were either putting it in, in inventory. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how they were accounting for it. But when you they sold it, I'm assuming I had somebody who I brought in to do the accounting part. Yeah. He dealt with that. He dealt with how to do the, the bookkeeping for um, inventory that wasn't itemized in the inventory list. Huh. So very interesting. So okay. So we wanted to talk about cash in this habit. And if I yes. analyze that last thirty minutes, uh, you know, yes, we wanted to talk about cash, but it's very, 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 very few segments where we have really spoken about. Cash. We are talking about revenue. We are talking about sales. We are talking about inventory, right? So cash is everywhere except. <laughs> Man, the cash needs to be because the accounting. in the bank. <laughs> right? That's right. So, you know, I've got a program. I teach this to people. And my sixth pillar is it's about the cash team. Everybody looks and says, who do they who do they blame? Who who gets blamed in the company if there's no cash in the bank? It's going to be finance it and accounting. Finance and accounting. They have nothing to do with it. What, exactly. what is their role? They, they do archiving. <laughs> They yep. will tell you what happened. If you're lucky, they can tell you what happened yesterday, yep. right? But yep. it goes all the way back. 
they're, they're not the one ordering the inventory. They're not the ones not keeping track. They're not the ones who are setting the price points. They're not the ones, and I've got a great story for you about price points. So that's the issue. It is who is on your team that's paying attention to cash. It's sales. It's marketing. It is certainly the CFO, the, the CFO but also the CFO, CEO or owners have a huge amount to do with the attitude of, of everybody else and operations. Yeah. It is a team sport. It is a sport. It is indeed a sport. And by the way, I mean, see, uh, you know, when I look at my finance and accounting guys, so, I mean, this is a fascinating story, by the way, mind blowing overall, the way you mentioned that, okay, you have inventory sitting, but that is not really recognized in, in, in books. Uh, and I am trying to blame, you know, who should be blamed in this? It Should it be CFO, the accountants? Because, you know, accounting, the inventory, whose responsibility is, you know, if you have an asset sitting in your warehouse, you know, that's your asset. You are doing the works. And if you were, let's say, getting audited, you know, you need to recognize those assets because that's your true financial standing. Otherwise, you don't really have the true financial. So here's the problem with most CFOs and the accountants. They are overall very conservative in their attitude, in, in the way they think about the systems, the way they think about finance and accounting. Their approach is very reactive in general. And what you are trying to describe here, they need to go outside of their comfort zone and really look into this whole uh, you know, magical science called operations, because that's where the opportunity is. And the way you are going to be accounting your inventory on your soft floor, that's going to drive whether you have the cash in your bank account or not. So in your experience, let's say if you were to coach a CFO and you do coach CFOs and the and the accountant, right? So if you were to coach right. them, you know, what role they should be taking? Should they be uh, understanding more into the operations and how they can streamline the cash? And by the way, the, the for all of this, I think the the integrated system and the processes, both of them are going to play a huge role because unless you can do the end-to-end -end traceability, you're never going to find out. Okay, if your finance is sitting somewhere in the corner, you are never going to know these these things, right, Dave? David? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So to me, the biggest hurdle on all of this is yep. mindset yep. comes first. Yep. And so it's the this is an integrated system, whether you whether you have a computer system that does it or not, yeah. whether you know what's happening or not, it exists, whether it's documented or not. And and it, and it, it is operations. But it also I, I want to tell you a story about sales in a minute. Yeah. But, but it's the mindset of, yes, we need to stop playing in silos. Yeah. And it's so we need to not only understand as a finance team. Yeah. The operations guys, we need to also stand, understand the salespeople and the exactly. sales mindset yeah. and the and the product management that sets pricing. Yep. So we can make recommendations on how they can do adjustments on and increase the profitability and the revenue by by pricing things properly. And in, if there's an incented sales force, so they're incented on the right thing. So it, that's where it's teamwork. But uh, conversely, you've got to get the operations guys to understand how they impact cash to the bottom line. The salespeople, how they, it's not what they think it is. The salespeople and the sales team often think top line. They don't realize that's not what contributes to the bottom line. Exactly. It's the margin that contributes. So that's where it's a holistic system. You've got to have a team if you really want to focus on generating internal cash. You're doing it as as a team. And how do you do that as a team? Because typically in my experience, uh, you know, when you are looking at the companies, they are going to have major silos inside the company. Okay, operations is operations, sales is sales, finance is finance. And I'll tell you the major driver why they do it that way. Because their KPIs, their careers, uh, you know, everything is aligned to their own success. Okay, how many boxes are you shipping? You are going to get paid based on that. Uh, you know, how many boxes you are shipping on time, it doesn't matter whether they are going to be profitable. Sales, how many boxes are you selling? That's it. They don't have to worry about any, you know, finance. How many, you know, how much well, cash did you collect today? <laughs> let, let me start with the sales yeah. because that's where a lot of this starts, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the challenges I've seen, I've been in sales. Yeah. I, I was a salesperson and managed sales teams. Yeah. And... I also sold very expensive products. Um, uh, sorry, it wouldn't be just expense. It's not the expense. It is 
premium products. Yeah, yeah. It's like selling, you know, it's more expensive than the competitors. Right. And right. I knew that we drove a lot of margin to the company. Yeah. So that's what I grew up with. That's what I started with. And so yeah. I love selling high margin, high value products. But I also had in the sales team guys who just sold the low margin stuff. Yeah. And I would scratch my head about their attitude towards volume, volume, volume. We'll make it up. You know, we'll lose a dollar, but we'll make it up in volume. It doesn't really work that way in real life. Yeah. Um, so one possibility is that you incent it based on margin okay. instead of revenue, total gross margin dollars. Or if you can't, if you don't want to reveal your margin, you divide it up into categories of products yeah. where you are commissioned more for the high margin products and yep. less for the low margin products. Yep. And then you change behavior. Those are the KPIs, but they're built in. Yeah, but overall for the long-term mindset, I mean, see, when you look at the integrated processes, so in this particular case, uh, it's probably, they are probably going to be selling the right products, which is great. But when you talk about thinking as the organization with the integrated processes, with the right. integrated data, with the integrated system, that's where the real rocket science is. Bringing everybody together, you know, it, it, having everybody probably, I'm not talking about technical, I'm talking about one right. system, one language that they speak, which is very, very, very difficult. <laughs> it is. And so what has to happen, though, for that kind of a sales incentive system to happen, they've got to work with the finance team yep. and the product yep. management team. Now, it might not impact in that particular case, the operations team, but those who have got to be cooperating. And that drives what? That drives the forecast for the operations team. and um, and I would have to think of another example to bring operations in with multiple parts, but yeah. we've already talked about that, where the finance is providing feedback and saying, listen, guys, you are stocking out, and that is creating a cash vacuum because we can't ship for a week. You've, and we So let's work together because oftentimes, especially in smaller companies, the operations guys know how to move stuff. They know how to bring stuff in, ship it out. They don't understand necessarily the analysis, which in theory, your your finance team should have some kind of an analytical capability. Right. So you marry them together to help do the analysis and make recommendations. So it's not that everybody is always on this involved with one project, but to bring in multiple multiple parts of the community at the same time. And eventually it's got to roll up into the, the real issue is the company. What is their objective? Exactly. Exactly. That right. is indeed the real issue. Yeah. And when the company's objective is revenue, that's where all sorts of my experience, if it's only revenue, things fall apart. When there's no revenue with a profit goal yeah. and that the profit goal is translated and with margin goals, you know, if, if whether you're looking at a balance sheet or a P&L, you, you sort of collectively all agree on at a high level, the CEO, CFO, COO, CMO, CSO, whatever C-level, they should all be in agreement that they should all be yeah. influenced and paid on those collective goals or a multiplicity of those goals. If all the C if all the sales captain, whatever the title is, is paid on is revenue and yeah. not margin, you will end up with problem. You will end up with deep discounting. You will end up, right? I mean, but not agree more. Right. But if they're in, but if part of their goal is you've got to hit a margin. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a big part of the upside for them. Yeah. All of a sudden yeah. becomes a different attitude. Yeah. And, and you start competing on value and finding the right clients who want to pay for the products, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So very interesting. So now I am going to be asking your advice overall in terms of 2023. We both know that it's probably going to be a tough year, uh, for most businesses. And one of the challenge that is going to be is the cash, okay? Which is probably going to be, most companies are going to be cash starved uh, in my mind, the way I am thinking about it. So let's say if you were to sort of uh, provide five areas that CFO should be looking at when it comes to the cash finding opportunity right now <laughs> inside the company, what are going to be some of those five areas? Well, that's a great idea. Um, I'm going to give a couple of my, one that might be throwaways, but they yeah. really are not. Yeah. yeah. And, and one is you got to have your books in order. Right. So you understand what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so another one is you need to have your cash cycle map, especially from order to 
cash. Yeah. What do I mean by mapped? I just worked with a client who I said, here's your sales forecast. What what does that mean when you make a sale right. on that chart? It took 15 minutes for the three people on the phone line to agree that was when an order was placed, right. not when it shipped. So that's a salesperson's definition of, yeah, yeah. of an order. Okay, so shipment is an accounting person's definition of when a sale is made. But then you've got to map it out to when are you getting the cash. Exactly. And this particular client has clients, their customers, it takes them between seven days and 81 days to get the cash in after the order is shipped. So they're all over the place, yeah, which yeah. is fun, which is just a starting point. But yeah. they didn't understand that. And all of a sudden they're going, oh, this is why we're having some, we have a hard time predicting our cash flow because we need to understand what our individual clients are doing. And, you know, if 20% of your clients are paying, you get the cash in seven days, right. and 80% are at 81, it's a whole lot different than if it's split. Exactly. But then you start doing something about it. You know, 81 days, if it's a good client, leave it alone, get factoring involved. So you get some cash in. It costs you some money, but you've got some cash. But if without that mapping, you're flying blind. Exactly. And some people might say, well, wait a minute, it's 30 days receivable for everybody. And part of the exercise they happened to do with this client, I said, okay. They said, well, they don't always pay in 30 days. Some pay sooner. Great. Look, which ones are those? And you map that out. So you're getting it in faster, but I can guarantee you there's clients that consistently pay late. Yep. And then you got to work on a client relationship or you say that's fine or you start taking a hard look, especially if you're product constrained, yeah. which is still an issue today, right? Yep. Who do you ship to? Yeah, exactly. Do you ship to the guy who's paying you in seven, you get the cash in seven days yep. or to the, the client it's 81? Now, strategically, you might ship 81, but you got to make these decisions with your eyes open. Now, I haven't been keeping track of how many pieces of advice. That, That's pretty I close to five, fun. I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other last minute closing advice, David, before we close? <laughs> you know what? As companies grow, the systems they use today are not the same systems that they need to use tomorrow. And it's the same thing with cash flow, that most of the time the cash flow systems are built by osmosis. They're not documented until there's a crisis. And so I would encourage everybody, if you have not had a cash flow crisis, to figure it out now, to put some money in the bank, because it's just a matter of time. It, COVID should have taught everybody about how critical cash was. But that's, um, that's my life's last piece of advice. Critical was a black swan event globally, yeah. but it's not a black swan event locally. Something will happen locally or within your industry that you you are going to want to be prepared for. Okay, could not agree more. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be that wherever you are trying to find cash, you are probably not going to find there because your cash is sitting in your operations, in your inventory, in your supply chain. So make sure you have deep understanding of that and have your financial side to that. On that note, David, I really want to thank you for your time. This has been a powerful episode. Wonderful. I, I, this has been a pleasure to have a conversation, Sam. It's really been a joy. It's my pleasure, David. Thank you so much once again. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming in the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about David or how focusing on cash flow can positively impact your company or your career, please schedule an appointment at davidsafier.com. It's D-A-V-I-D-S-A-F-E-E-R.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Alok Ajmera, who shares the corporate performance management CPM function and breaks down its processes into the tactical cost saving and strategic components. Also, the interview with Aaron Spool from Aventus Advisory Group, who describes what it means to have a cash flow mindset in the organization. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us 
on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.